9.3 is combining two functions by using products. So you know what a product is. Product just means you're going to multiply. The same rules apply as addition and subtraction when it comes to domain. So remember, for your domain, you need to find out what the restrictions are on each of the functions. And then you find out where they intersect. In other words, the functions have to be using the same domains in order for you to multiply them. So we'll look at a couple of different examples here of what you would have to restrict. Um, I'm just using some examples directly from the textbook. Also this section, um, the whole section of combining functions, they use a lot of graphing calculators um, because some of them are kind of difficult to find um, values for. It's a, a long, long list of making tables of values. Whereas graphing calculators, you just put in the functions and bingo, you got the graphs. So I'm going to do one with the graphs, I'll show you. And um, that's going to be it. It's going to be a very short lesson. Okay, so here's an example where they give you um, two functions that have coordinates. Remember, so these are just simply points on a coordinate plane. And they want to know, what is f times g at x? So just like with the addition ones, you have to find out where do they have the same domain? So if you look at this function, they both have a zero for an x value. Uh, this one has one, this one has a two. And this one has a two and a 10. So we can do these two, twos, and that's it, right? I don't have four. Uh, this one doesn't have a six for, that one doesn't have four. So those are the only two. So that means that f times g at x is going to be, your solution is just going to be two coordinates. And they will be 0 and 3 times 4, which is 12. And the other point will be 2 and minus 20. And there you go. That's, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Okay, number 4. So let me bring it up on the screen here. Number four was determine f times g at x for each of the following pairs of functions. So they give you this function and this one. You're going to multiply them together. So that means that f times g at x is going to be 2 sine x. That'll be in the numerator. And in the denominator, you're going to have x minus 1. I just multiply them together. That's all I did. So what are the restrictions on this domain? Um, the second part, that's question five. It says, what is the domain and range of this function? So you know that this function, g at x, has a domain restriction that x cannot be equal to one because that would make a zero in the denominator. Two sine x, there's no restrictions on the domain. So the only one you have to look at is here. So the domain will be x is an element of real numbers. x is not equal to one. So x is an element of real numbers x not equal to 1, and that would be our domain. Now what is the range? So you could do a series of points where you figure out what 2 sine x is, and of course you're going to be using radians here, and then find out some coordinates for this, or like I said, you can get out your trusty calculator, turn it on, there's one that I did already, so you just go into function, y equals, uh, oh, that was it. So I had 2 sine x divided by x minus 1. You graph it, and there it is there. So here's our restriction here that it can't be equal to 1. And you would say the range, well, the range goes all the way down this way, goes all the way up this way. So the range would be real numbers. Range f times g at x is an element of real numbers. There you go. How easy is that? Okay, so for the second one here, we have a logarithmic function times an exponential function. So I'm just going to write out what it would look like if I multiplied these two together. And usually put the exponential first, so it would be 2x log of x plus 4. Now let's talk about the domain here. So domain means what can you put in for x and get an answer. So for the exponential function, there's no restriction. x is an element of real numbers. But the logarithmic function, you know that this x plus 4 has to be greater than 0. So that means that for this one, the log function, 
x has to be greater than negative 4. Not equal to because you can't have the log of 0. This one is x is an element of real numbers. So it means that the domain of f times g at x is going to be da, 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 x is greater than negative 4. x is an element of real numbers. Now the range, and this one is a little tricky because without graphing it, you probably wouldn't know what to write. So I'm going to write it as 2 to the x, whoops, where did that come from? 2 to the power of x, there we go, times, and it was the log of x plus 4. So you plug in log bracket x plus 4, close the bracket, and let's graph that and see what we get. So you can see that the function is approaching zero here. And if you looked at a table of values, we can look at the table. Table. You can see that as we get smaller and smaller, oh, there we get an arrow at minus four because that is a restriction. But if you keep going less than four, oh, errors everywhere. Okay, so that means the range started at zero and it goes on. So we get x. Well, we don't have two, two to any power here is never zero and the log of something is never, never zero. So that should mean that the range should be greater than zero. And we have greater than or equal to zero, I'm sorry. So, um, f times g at x is greater than or equal to 0, and x is an element of real numbers. Because we had that one value here of minus 3 gave us 0. Okay, obviously that's for this one here, right? Because when I put in minus 3, minus 3 plus 4 is 1. What is log 1? 10 to what power gives me 1? And you would say 0. So when this becomes 0, zero times this number will give me zero. Okay, number 8a, if we go back to the question here, what was the question? It says, for each of the following pairs of functions, state the domain of f times g at x. Okay, so domain of f times g at x, well, I had written down, all I had to look. So I need to know what would be the restriction in this denominator here, right? So I better factor that f at x equals 1 over, multiplies to minus 14, adds to minus 5, so that would be x minus 7 and x plus 2. So the domain is, this is the domain of f at x, it's going to be x is not equal to minus 2 and 7. And what is the restriction on the domain of secant x? So remember secant x is 1 over the cos of x. So if I do a quick sketch of cos x here, it's a really quick one here. So this is 2 pi here. Where is it going to be 0? Because remember, I want to know the secant. Remember the secant had asymptotes here, and then it just goes this way, right? There's secant function. So x cannot be equal these two values. So that's pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 if we go between 0 and 2 pi. So this would be x is not equal to, um, what did I say, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So depending on if they gave you the domain for the function, because as you know, you can go on and on and on, right? You could go forever. So um, that's what we're going to write for this one, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So that's assuming they're only looking at a domain of 0 to 2 pi. Okay, the last question I'm going to do is one of these good old revenue questions that you did in grade 10, grade 11, and now in grade 12. You did it, I think, earlier in this textbook as well. So you've got 20,000 people go to a park and pay $25. For every dollar increase, a park loses 750 customers. They want you to write out a revenue equation. Now remember that revenue Revenue is equal to the number of tickets times the price. That right? is how much money you're bringing in. So a dollar increase in the ticket price. So that's 
$25 plus X, so that's be 1X at to 25, and I'm going to lose, so I started with 20,000 people, and I'm going to lose 750 every time I raise the price by $1. So your let statement would be, let X represent every dollar increase in price. And so that would cover it here. So if I go up a dollar, I lose 750. If I went up two dollars, I'd lose 1,500 people. So they want you to set up the revenue equation. So this is revenue. We could put an X in here, R at X. And then you could expand this. But the last part of the question asks you to determine where is the um, maximum. What's the maximum? This is a product function, right? The product of two functions, one being this was the ticket price. So you got ticket price times times visitors. So it is a product function here, this times this. You didn't even know you were doing that. And you were, you were making a combination of two functions. Okay, so if you wanna find the maximum ticket price, remember, um, I think your textbook tells you to use your graphing, graphing calculator to find it, but I bet you can remember how to do that from your um, days in grade 10. So you would find the zeros, right? Find the zero. So the zero of this would be uh, minus 25. And the zero for this one, uh, you'd have to divide. You'd have to divide 20,000 divided by 750, right? We're solving for X here. And you get 26.66, 26 26.66. Let's round it to seven. So those are my two zeros. And remember that the maximum is going to occur halfway between those zeros. So 26.666 minus 25 divided by two. And that gives me 8.33, 8.33. So that's 83 cents. So x is equal to x is equal to 0 0.83, and therefore your ticket price, ticket price. So you didn't need a graphing calculator to do that. Well, you might have used it to multiply. Ticket price is twenty-five dollars and eighty-three cents. So again, this combining two products using uh, two functions by using their products very simple. Um, once again, something I didn't mention in the last lesson as well. They talk a lot about even and odd functions. Do you remember an even function? An even function is a function where f at x equals f at negative x. So quickly, let me just show you very quickly what I mean by that. You've come across this before, where if you have a function, and the best one to show you this on is x squared. So if I do f at 1, well, let's do 2 because it's a little easier. You're not using two ones. So if I had 2 and min and 4 and minus 2 and 4, so f at 2 is equal to 4 and f at minus 2 is equal to 4. Right? You get the same height. That's a plus 4. So f at 2 equals f at minus 2. So that means that f at x is equal to f at negative x. That means even function. Okay, what's an odd function? I should just do a quick little video on even and odds. Maybe I'll do like a dictionary, a math dictionary. What are these terms? The odd one, and now this is, they're even and odd because they're talking about the symmetry about the y-axis. So y equals x cubed is an odd function. So let's look at um, 2. 2 cubed is 8. But minus 2 cubed is minus 8, right? Minus 8. Minus 2, minus 8. Oops, I put 28 there. You know what I'm saying. So what happens this time is that f at f at 2 is equal to 8, and f at minus 2 is equal to minus 8. So they're the same numbers, but they have a different sign. Whereas opposed to these ones, they were exactly the same. So that meant that f at 2 was equal to the negative of f at minus 2. Okay, because I negative the negative 8 to make it the same as 8. So 
in terminology, math terminology, you say f of x equals the negative f of negative x. It sounds really complicated, but I think this makes it very clear. So this is what you call an odd function. And this is all talking about symmetry. Okay, just a little heads up on that because you might see some of those questions in your homework assignment. Okay, that's it for now. We're almost finished chapter nine. You must be getting excited to get out of advanced functions with a 95. Talk to you soon. Bye.